I'm sure you've heard me talk about 26shirts.com before, but just in case you haven't, let me fill you in. At 26 Shirts, they sell different limited edition sports-themed t-shirts every two weeks. After a shirt's prospective two-week run is over, the design is retired and never sold again. They are operating out of Buffalo and now also offer options in Chicago. For every shirt sold, $8 is donated to a family in need. Not to a major charity or foundation, but to an actual family or individual in need. To show our support here at Chasing Cinema, when you buy a shirt, we will automatically put you into a drawing to win the next shirt free. That's right. You buy a shirt, $8 goes to help a family or individual in need, and you get a shot to win the next shirt absolutely free from Chasing Cinema. So go to www.26shirts.com and buy a unique Buffalo Sports Design t-shirt, help a great cause, and also get entered to win the next shirt absolutely free. Again, that's 26shirts.com because you have the ability to help a complete stranger just because it's the right thing to do. www.26shirts.com. Help someone now. everyone and thank you for tuning in to ChasingCinema.com's official YouTube channel. I'm your host Jacob Toronto and if you've not, please hit that subscribe button on that iTunes page so each week our episodes are automatically downloaded to your iPad, your iPod, um, your iPhone, whatever it might be that you're listening to this on, uh, it'll be automatically downloaded. But if you're not an iTunes person, no big deal. Head over to YouTube.com slash Chasing Cinema and you can hit subscribe there because our podcast as well as daily video news are uploaded there. Today I have a special guest and a good friend of mine. He's been on this podcast probably more than uh, we could even count. His name is Josh Bell. He's the film editor over at the Las Vegas Weekly. Sir, how are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm excited because uh, there's a lot to talk about here, and uh, you know we're gonna be I'm, we're gonna kind of be talking about a lot of different movies with Terminator. Uh, we're gonna be reviewing Terminator Genesis today, and we're probably gonna talk about all Terminator movies. Um, we're gonna be talking about Magic Mike Double XL or XXL, however you prefer to to say it. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this podcast. Um, before we get into all that, though, uh, just briefly. Josh, I know you're constantly watching stuff. Um, I, I check. Uh, you could check out all the reviews that Josh writes on LasVegasWeekly.com or his personal page, uh, JoshBellHatesEverything.com. Uh, or you could just follow him on Twitter. That's really easy because he tweets out everything that he writes, at SignalBleed. Um, Josh, have you seen the new show Scream? Because I, I really have been hearing a lot about it, and I wanted to know if you've seen it or not yet. Uh, I have. Yeah. I mean, I've just seen the first episode. That was all that was available for review. So I think that aired uh, a few days ago. So anyone else could have seen it too. But um, so I, you know, I haven't, I, I don't have any uh, insights beyond what's aired, what other people have seen. But uh, as far as that first episode goes, I, I wasn't too impressed. And, and I like the Scream movies a lot, actually. Me too. Uh, Me too. Even, even some of the uh, lesser um the less acclaimed movies in the series. I mean, I, I actually thought Scream 4 was was quite uh, entertaining. So I, I'm, I'm inclined to enjoy something uh, from this franchise, I guess you could call it. But the, the series doesn't really have any of the creative team behind it. Uh, Kevin Williamson, who uh, wrote the original and, and most of the rest of the series isn't involved, and Wes Craven, who directed all of them, is credited as an executive producer, but I think that may just be like a contractual obligation. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so they're not, they don't take part in it. And and the series is, I mean, it, it kind of tries to copy some of the, the cleverness and the, the meta commentary that the movies have, but it doesn't really do much with that. And it's mostly just a, I don't know. It seemed to me like a like an ABC family level kind of hokey murder mystery in this in this town with a bunch of pretty faces, of course, because it's on MTV. Um, it, it, it just 
And, and it doesn't involve any of the characters from the movies. It's a completely new mystery with new characters. And the killer wears the mask, but they, I, I think for some licensing reason, they're not able to use the mask from the movies. Okay, and yeah. so, so he has to wear a different mask. And so it really doesn't have a very strong connection to the movies anyway. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of a mediocre teen murder mystery series uh, that happens to have this familiar brand name attached to it. Gotcha. And, uh, well, because when I watched the first look or the trailer that came out some time back, like, I thought they were just really kind of replicating the whole entire movie because I think there's, there's like, a scene where the character's like, well, um, the, the you know, Jamie Kennedy's character in the first two screams would be the guy with – who tells us all the rules of surviving a horror movie. And, and there's that scene in the first film where he's in the film class talking about – um, you know, sequels being better than the original and talking about how, you know, a horror movie rules are established. And in this one, it seems like there's a character who's like, well, if a horror movie is actually turned into a television show, you can't really. And is that, I mean, is, does it try to replicate a lot of the scenes or, or very ver- familiar storyline that we know of Scream? Or is it kind of just teasing that? I mean, a little bit. There is the what you described. There is the character who I suppose could be analogous to the Jamie Kennedy character um, who is all plugged into pop culture and knows how things go. Um, but but I, I, I do think that the commentary that he offers is not nearly as clever as what the movie's offered. Yeah. And that scene, that scene where he talks about uh, making a slasher movie into a TV series, I thought was kind of ridiculous because the whole thing he says in that scene is basically, you can't do a slasher movie as a TV series. It's like, well, why are you telling us that your show is going to not work? work? Yeah, right? I don't know if that's really a good idea. <laughs> yeah, um, so, I mean, it also, it also does, um, sort of replicate the the whole gimmick in the in the screen movies where there's an opening scene where a sort of a famous uh actor plays someone who gets killed off right away um although the scene doesn't play out the same way as as say the drew barrymore scene in the original scream movie oh, yeah. but there is a character who shows up at the beginning of the show uh who's played by bella thorne who uh for people who watch mtv i guess is a famous person <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh and and she you know has a connection to the actual main characters and she gets killed kind of right at the beginning and that and that kicks off this whole mystery she's dead and so suddenly it's like what's going on gotcha. um but as far as who the rest of the characters are i think they're very different uh the backstory um that they kind of build into the mystery is 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 more like the origin story for jason Voorhees, i think than anything um or even michael myers uh than anything that was in the screen movies so it it's not i mean i i guess it's a good thing that they're trying to do their own thing and not just copy every beat of the movies Mm -hmm. but then on the other hand you wonder well why is this even Called, called screen, screen yeah. other than the fact that somebody paid yeah. paid money for this license <laughs> and people know what it is. Yeah. Um, so no, I think uh, again, as someone who actually is a is a fan, maybe even more than the average person of these movies. I mean, the original Scream, I think, is probably one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I would not recommend the show. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Scream. I mean, I think that was one of the movies that you know scared me as a child to answer to phones and, and, you know, but however, I just love that movie so much, I think because, uh, you know, we are huge movie fans. So obviously all the movie talk in the film, you know, is really interesting and fun. And, and they really were clever about talking about all these references. Uh, did you find yourself relating to Jamie Kennedy a lot when you were younger? <laughs> oh, I don't know if I really ever want to say that I would relate to <laughs> well, Jamie that's Kennedy. True. Jenny, Jamie uh, Kennedy's character in this movie of, yeah, you know, I don't know. No, I mean, Jamie Kennedy's character in the movie uh, is kind of this hyperactive motor mouth, which is definitely not me. Um, so, no, I mean, I like m- movies and I like horror movies. And certainly by the time I saw Scream, which came out for me when I was in high school, I believe, um, I had seen a lot of horror movies at that point. So I, I, I certainly got the jokes. Uh, but I don't know if I would say I uh, 
uh, identified with Jamie, Jamie Kennedy's Kennedy. Kid. J- Jamie Kennedy personally is not a fan of mine. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but no, I, that was one of Jamie Kennedy's better roles. I will, I will say. Yeah, it's uh, probably my only. I mean, I and besides, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. One of the few that I really enjoy him in, but nonetheless. Yeah. But all right, well, then I guess my question is: Do you think that you know? How do you feel you would do in a horror movie? Would you be one of the lasting <laughs> survivors, or where do you think you're? you're no, you know? no, no, I'd get, I'd get killed right away. No. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible at self-preservation. I think I would be the first to go. All right. Well, that's awesome. If you want to read more of uh, Josh's full review, you can find it on LasVegasWeekly.com. Um, Josh also just put a really funny piece up there that I didn't know he wrote until earlier today uh, about movies that Arnold Schwarzenegger should revisit and, and react in. And, uh, you know, I, I love this article. Did you um, – was was this just you kind of pitching to Las Vegas Weekly saying, like, look – I would like to write this piece where they're like, hey, write about Arnold Schwarzenegger, and this is the idea you came up with. Uh, no, that was all my editor trying to get some silly sidebar thing for the Terminator review. So, gotcha. um, you know, I kind of tossed that off. I don't know. I, I find those those things a little, I don't know. Sometimes sometimes when, when, when the assignment is to say something funny, I, I don't know. I think that's um that ends up being just kind of belabored so i'm glad you liked it because <laughs> yeah well my only wasn't... question was why batman and robin was left out because if any character needs to be revisited it's there definitely mr freeze i you know <laughs> i don't know i just kind of threw in the first three he said do three of them and i threw in oh and he my editor told me i uh, he wanted me to include predator <laughs> okay. um which which i think is 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 a legitimately i mean yeah, obviously no. the whole the whole thing is kind of a joke but um I, if they did make another Predator movie, I think bringing him back would actually uh, make a certain amount of sense and would help that franchise. Uh, unlike the other two that I picked in there, the Predators, obviously there have been a number of sequels yeah. and spinoffs and whatnot to Predator. Um, and I'm sure whoever owns the rights to that is busy trying to get it going again because that's oh, yeah. how things always are. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Totally. I would be happy to see... <laughs> Him in uh, maybe now that the DC movie universe, yeah, it's a solo Mister Freeze movie, uh, you it. know, or at least a cameo or, or something <laughs> like that. I'm sure, I'm sure that would be amusing. I, you know, to the to tell the truth, I have actually never seen Batman and Robin. Oh, really? So, yeah. Oh wow, I'm surprised. Well, okay, well this you definitely got to see it, or I could just send you the YouTube clips of every pun Arnold Schwarzenegger I, makes in the movie. That I actually have seen. Okay, the, uh, the supercut there, but no, I think after seeing Batman Forever. And this was before I was seeing movies professionally, so there was really no more, you know, uh, I, I didn't have any desire to see another one of those Joel Schumacher Batman movies, so okay. I, I didn't, and I never have. Well, you know, Predator, I mean, I, I've seen Predator, it's never had a huge impact on me, but what another movie you mentioned is definitely Kindergarten Cop, and I would love to see Arnold return in that role, but it seems like they're... You know, kind of going it. Last I heard about it was that they were talking about remaking it, and then they were talking about making it to a, a television show. So I don't know how how many chances of that is, but that is a movie that I would absolutely love to see again as another kindergarten cop. Yeah, I I I, I think you're right that they're they're talking about a remake or a possible TV show, and a lot of times they kind of float these things and they never go anywhere. But um yeah, I mean, it's another thing. They could probably, if they pay him enough, they could probably get him to do a cameo. But I don't know if he really wants to do it revisit again. that entire uh, role. I think maybe we'll see how, if the Terminator does well, then maybe he'll be more eager to to rehash some of these past roles. And if they get that Conan sequel off the ground that they've been talking about for years, um, which I think will also probably depend at least partially on how the Terminator does. Yeah. Well, we'll talk more about Arnold Schwarzenegger as we get into more of the Terminator review. But I just wanted to kind of catch up with Josh and see what else he's been watching. Lately. So, I, and I know you watch a ton of stuff. I mean, thank God for Letterbox. That's the only way I'm <laughs> able to keep up. Uh, what else have you seen lately that's interesting or, or you think worth talking about? Oh, uh, God, what have I seen? Um, well, I mean, obviously a whole lot of uh, new stuff. But as far as older stuff, you know, I watched... Um, uh, last week or something like that, uh, Battleship Potemkin, which I'd never seen before. Oh, and, um, yeah. 
So in the meantime, I've never seen uh, Batman and Robin, and I had never seen Battleship Potemkin, and I watched Battleship Potemkin though, so that was that was kind of my choice there. <laughs> okay, I could well, have watched good. Batman and Robin, but I went with the uh, classic uh, landmark in cinema history. Well, this instead. is make you know. The, I'm glad you watched that film. I mean, it's a great movie. Has one of my, I think. Um, easily go to references uh, of how to explain how well like juxtaposition is with and, and a montage and in one of the most um kind of disturbing uh montages i think are in that film but but my mind is turning wheels are turning in my head and i'm just like you know what i need to bring my blu-ray over of batman and robin sit down with josh <laughs> and i'm just gonna put a, i'm gonna put a mic on us and we're just gonna talk while the oh, movie's boy. going <laughs> and oh, we could just man. we could have our own commentary track yeah. for batman and robin <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, but um, well, if that's reaching, I think we do need to do an episode about uh, movies, about Batman and Robin. About, well, maybe about Batman and Robin, but at least maybe do one where we actually talk about the movies that people talk about all the time that we've missed. Because I'm sure you oh, get that question. You know, there's so many. Yeah, I'm sure you get that question all the time because I get a movie and people are like, "You've never seen that, and you're a film critic." I'm yeah. like, "Yeah, it's possible, man. I can't. I'm only human. I can only see as much as I can see. Right. Like, there's plenty." What, is there one that always people always ask you about not seeing before? Oh, I don't know. You know, the truth is uh, there are so many classic movies along along the lines of Battleship Potemkin that um, that I've never seen. But that people rarely ask about those. Yeah. People will ask about some some Random, crappy movie yeah. from their childhood that they have nostalgia for, eighties movies and stuff like that. I, I, I try to. I'm drawing a blank now. I can't think of any off the top of my head. But I things think- like things like Goonies, which I actually have seen but i hadn't for a long time um which and which which didn't really do anything for me but um things like that that aren't necessarily considered great classics but that have this this sort of personal yeah. meaning to people and they think like how could you not have seen this movie because i've watched it a hundred times. times i think yeah. the last one i got was Ernest uh Ernest scared stupid or something oh, like God. that yeah. <laughs> people like you never saw that i was like uh no <laughs> i actually don't you know like i guess not i must have missed that one but uh, yeah that, i think hmm? no go on Oh no! I was just gonna. I, I think the Ernest movies maybe uh, had their pop culture height probably before you were uh, before you were a, a big movie goer. I think I, I think I saw a couple of them when I was a kid, but uh, I don't think I've seen uh, that particular one either. Yeah, well, because my someone w- they were talking about movies, and I assumed it was Monster Squad, but I was wrong, and it ended up being Ernest Scared Stupid. And I said, "Oh, I've never seen that." They said, "Oh my god!" And I was like, "Well." Go watch Little Monsters or The Monster Squad. I'm sure they're much better than Ernest Scared Stupid. But again, you know, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, that's funny. So, yeah, we'll have to maybe do that podcast of all the movies we've never seen that people talk <laughs> about all the time. But uh, anyway, all right. Well, that's great. Uh, uh, um, also, Josh has been doing a lot of uh, research for Terminator Genesis. And um, I believe in what he calls summer school. On JoshBellHatesEverything.com, he went back and revisited all the Terminator movies. So, of course, he's not mentioning those because I'm sure he knows we're going to talk about them when we're getting to the review. But before we get into Terminator Genesis, which I know is what everyone wants us to talk about, let's talk about Magic Mike really quick. Uh, well, not real quick, but, well, it depends on how we, <laughs> how this conversation goes. But um, do, uh, actually, Magic Mike was kind of at the time before I started chasing cinema, Um I think it was, you know, in 2012, so I didn't actually end up reviewing it. I I didn't remember I didn't review it. The other night I was looking, and I was like, oh, my God, I didn't review Magic Mike. But uh, I'm sure you did. What were your thoughts on um, Magic Mike? Uh, I thought it was okay. I mean, I think it got mostly positive reviews and probably mostly more positive than mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe I gave it two and a half stars out of five, kind of a a middle-of-the-road rating. Uh, to me, the thing about Magic Mike was I, I didn't think it was necessarily that interesting a story or, or character creation. Uh, but I thought what Steven Soderbergh brought to it as director elevated it above what it could have been with the same, the same script and the same actors, but a different director. I thought it had a cool look to it, the way certain scenes were edited, kind of in an off kilter way, the colors. Um, and, and there was some, complexity to the story um that it wasn't just hey here's a bunch of dudes taking their clothes off it was you know what is the cost of this kind of lifestyle and how does it work for some and not for others um and 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 matthew mcconaughey was very entertaining that was kind of one of the first uh 
comeback roles for him Mm -hmm. um, where people looked at him in a new way and said, hey, this guy actually, he can he can act and he can take on some interesting roles. So I thought it was better than I expected that it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still not as good uh, as I hoped based on Steven Soderbergh, who I think is is a genius. Uh, and and especially the fact that he's made other movies with care, with premises or stars that you think, how is this going to work? Uh, something like The Girlfriend Experience with Sasha Gray. And, uh, and it turns out to actually be really, uh, really well made. And this was probably not quite on the level as far as I was concerned. Yeah, because my mind was immediately like, oh, wow. Like, they are just really ranking in like, oh, hey, come look at Channing Tatum dance for an hour and a half. But I was surprised, too. I was like, oh, wow, like this movie, like there's some really great. I mean, from what I remember, uh, like there were some really great shots. The movie was shot, you know, very interestingly. I thought there was definitely some you know, I was definitely surprised by kind of I was into it, but I was like also shocked on how like well received that movie was because I kind I mean, I didn't really care for it, but it was definitely better than expected. But I mean, people were raving about that movie. A lot of critics really enjoyed it. People were really surprised. Um, but I think it was kind of the point where I was like, maybe Channing Tatum is more than just kind of what he's um, being teased to be. And I think Chan Tatum has surprised a lot of people by coming, you know, doing comedy with, um, the Jump Street movies and then doing, you know, Foxcatcher, which I thought he was, uh, unfortunately just kind of matched up with a few, uh, obviously a better performance, but I thought he was, he was good in Foxcatcher. And I, and I really feel like he's always kind of challenging himself to do, you know, better performances and things like that. Uh, and I had a really great time, um, with the fact that Kevin Nash was in this movie, uh, a, a WCW and WWE superstar that not many people know, and he was kind of always he was in the background, and I was just like, "This is the funniest inside joke in the movie," and half these people don't understand that that man used to be a former wrestler. Um, but I, I agree. I think Matthew McConaughey was probably one of my favorite parts in the original Magic Mike. I mean, man is just super entertaining. He, he's he's he is great in it, and that's funny you said that because we were trying. I was trying to talk about like that change in Matthew McConaughey where people said, oh, you know what? I think that you know this man can do more than we kind of perceive him as too. But Magic Mike was a movie that I kind of just forgot about over time, you know, unless someone else made a joke about it or, uh, you know, or the you know felt the need to tell me that Magic Mike was based on Channing Tatum's past experiences as a stripper, which was like a big talk after that movie. And, you know, and I just thought it was, you know, like, all right, whatever. And then no surprise, this movie that was, I think was made for like under $10 million grossed $147, $148 million worldwide. So it's, it's like, I'm sure we're going to get a sequel down the road. But I was doubtful because of just where Channing Tatum was going in his direction of his career, where it kind of seems like he's trying to take on these more challenging, challenging roles that he would do Magic Mike too. But I guess it's more of a personal project for him. Yeah, I mean, he and, and Soderbergh actually financed the first movie themselves um, because no one else was interested in this movie about male strippers. And so uh, I'm sure they made a ton of money off of that because, as you said, it was made for so little and it grossed so much. And given that they were the two of them, the financiers of the movie, the financiers of the movie, I'm sure the, all the profits went right to them. So um, it was a very lucrative uh, endeavor for both uh, of those guys and and obviously a passion project I mean certainly for Channing Tatum as you say and as everyone says it's based partially on his early experiences um, but for Soderbergh too I think when he met Channing Tatum and heard about this idea he really 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 got into it and and I think one of the reasons that Magic Mike works if it does is because these two guys are so dedicated to this idea mm-hmm. it's not just Absolutely. it's not just some kind of like cash grab like oh if we make a movie about male strippers we'll get a bunch of women to come see it no these guys really had a had a passion for this movie and in fact put their money up their own money up so that they could get it made um and i think that that comes across in the first movie but uh but now since it's so successful and since it made so much money and it became a pop culture phenomenon doing a sequel is is more a matter of just uh milking that audience again yeah um i totally agree and you know but i I, i'm just now when they say sequel though I think I think most people's minds went to cash grab, but I think there was some hope that maybe this movie would be able to recreate some of the the actual 
really kind of talented, you know, the talented filmmaking in Magic Mike, though this project lost Steven so- uh, Soderbergh because, I, I mean, I guess he's retired, semi-retired kind of thing. Um, but, you know, now we have Gregory Jacobs, who I believe was a producer um, and like an assistant director on the first movie taking this project over. So, um Quickly from imdb.com, I'm going to give you guys a quick plot synopsis. Magic Mike, double XL. Three years after Mike bowed out of the stripper life at the top of his game, he and the remaining Kings of Tampa hit the road to Myrtle Beach to put on one last blowout performance. It was directed by Gregory Jacobs. And um, Mr. Bell, of course, I want to let my guests go first. What were your thoughts about Magic Mike, double XL? I really, really disliked this movie. (laughs) And, and I mean, as, as I was just saying, I thought the first one was, if not great, at least surprisingly decent in parts. And, and I, I thought this would probably be okay too, because although Gregory Jacobs is the director and, and Soderbergh is not, Soderbergh is very involved in this film. Uh, he's, he's not only an executive producer, he's also the cinematographer and the editor on this film. Um, and, and Gregory Jacobs not only was the first AD on the previous Magic Mike, but has been the first AD on most of Soderbergh's films throughout his career. So they've worked together for a long time. Um, and, and Channing Tatum still obviously has this great enthusiasm for the character. Uh, the screenwriter is the same, who's one of Channing Tatum's friends, although the screenplay was, was one of the weakest parts of the first movie. So I, I, but honestly, I went into this thinking, this will probably be okay. Um, and it just completely abandons any of the interesting things that the first movie did. Uh, there's no complexity to the characters. Uh, there's no ambivalence about this world of stripping and, and what it means for, for people. And um, even visually, and I don't know uh, how much of Soderbergh's work as DP uh, was sort of his own creative ideas versus what the director uh, asked for. I mean, Soderbergh is a very collaborative guy, so I could absolutely see him saying, hey, this is your film, you just tell me how to shoot it, and I'll shoot it the way that you want. Um, but, I mean, we, we can't really know how that went. But, but I mean, I think even on, from a visual standpoint or from a pacing and editing standpoint, which was some of the really better things about the first movie, uh, I think this movie fails. There's essentially no plot uh, and, and the whole idea that Mike wanted to get out of stripping and start this business for himself, which was the driving force of the first movie, he's done that. And these guys come back at the beginning of this movie and it's basically like, hey, do you want to come strip? And he's like, all right, sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's there's no dramatic tension to this movie whatsoever. They are going on this road trip, this kind of meandering road trip, just an excuse for various set pieces that are not really connected to each other in any way. And even even the the kind of rudimentary structure of this uh, of this kind of movie where they're going to this big uh, gathering and they have to put on a performance they want to do well. I mean, we've seen this in countless movies where it's like the big competition at the end and we gotta bring our best or whatever. It's like like Pitch, Pitch Perfect, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but the 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 big finale of this movie it, it's not even a competition they're not trying to win anything uh they basically just go and have fun and then it's the end of the movie yeah uh and so it's just this disconnected series of performances that are very much pandering to the audience that liked the first movie not for its dramatic complexity but for the naked dudes mm-hmm. um and, and so for those people i guess if that's what you are looking for there will be a lot of that in this movie. Um, and so in that sense, I suppose it succeeds. <laughs> but, but I mean, again, that's like going to see a, a, an action movie that's just wall-to-wall explosions with no story and no characters. Or, or, or going to see a movie that's full of, of, of female nudity, which, you know, is far more prevalent. And, and, and which, again, is just kind of pandering to to this base interest and and doesn't tell you a story or give you anything interesting from a filmmaking standpoint so i i I really thought this movie was a failure but surprisingly it's gotten quite a few good reviews so maybe i just can't connect with the whole magic mic experience oh no 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 sir i don't think so because let me tell you i 100 percent agree with everything that you said i really really dislike this movie um i first of all yeah and i think the first thing i want to address is that i couldn't even under i couldn't even the moment channing tatum's like all right as you know as josh bell rephrased i 
I don't believe it. I couldn't even accept the movie that they were trying to feed me because automatically I'm just like, wait a minute. The first movie is like, I got to get out of this lifestyle. This isn't who I am anymore. I want to make a difference. I want to build this company. I, I need to get this guy health care. And then we never hear about this business again. We never hear about his one lonely worker who's probably out of business now because Channy Tatum forgot to manage anything. And it's just it's just like, wait, what? You want to go? And then to me, I, I mean, I, I guess you kind of understood the co- the 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 um co- the convention better than i did cuz my whole thing was like wait is this a competition do they win anything like and in my opinion what a con- in my head what a convention is this isn't a- i don't know if this is a convention i was really confused about the whole motive in general you know like they kind of referenced it would be their last little get up but why would i mean why would they do all new routines just for one more time i'm sure they're going to do it again they even addressed that some people have nothing else to do afterwards so i was really confused i thought the movie really did a poor job at portraying exactly what our end goal was and you like you said it was because of the storytelling and I And to be honest, I mean, I'm not sure. It seems that I've talked to a few people that don't really necessarily agree with me on this, but I thought this movie just visually looked awful a lot of the time. I, I felt that I, I, I honestly had an experience where I thought that I forgotten my 3D glasses because some <laughs> scenes were out of focus. And I was like, wait, am I in a 3D screening? Um, and I thought just scenes were poorly lit for no reason at all. I mean... Steven Spoderberg, like, you know, being a cinematographer on this, you know, hopefully is really cool. I mean, because if you compare the visual style of Magic Mike and Magic Mike 2, it looked like Magic Mike 2 just kind of really tried to copy that but didn't do a good job at it. Um, like, for instance, when Jada Pinkett Smith makes her appearance in the movie, I didn't know it was Jada Pinkett Smith until like two shots after when we get a close up of her face in the light. I was like, oh, man, that was Jada. I don't know if you experienced that, but I, I mean, that and... The the quote unquote love interest, I guess, for Channing Tatum. The first time we have the conversation with her, we don't get to see her face either. I didn't really get to see what she looked like until later in the movie. Yeah, um, so that might be a stylistic choice. I mean, to to kind of shroud certain things in darkness. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it really it really succeeds. Was effective here? Yeah, no, no, no. Because I mean, I get it when we don't always have to be in bright lights and we need to be focused in. But I mean, at least give me a reason to understand why that is. Or I mean, that's the thing is I don't know if it was too enhance a storytelling or for a stylistic choice or just because of they just didn't care you know i mean that's when that's kind of a situation that makes it like questionable obviously um but yeah my whole thing about this movie is just that i didn't care really what was going on and i didn't buy what was going on i just didn't understand the change you know in mike and i didn't understand where we were going and why we were going there and i think that was overall the reason why this this movie failed in my opinion to to entertain me i mean there were there are moments in this movie that are funny and, and that will get laughs and smiles. And, of course, like you said, Josh, I totally agree. If girls are going to see this movie to watch Channing Tatum shirtlessly grind on stage, then absolutely. This movie was literally made just for you. But other than that, I don't see any good in this movie. They really stripped it, uh, no pun intended, of all the qualities that made the first one, even, you know, giving us a second reason to look at it. Um I'm yeah. To, yeah. Okay. Go on. <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, one of the other things that, that we didn't mention is Matthew McConaughey is not in this movie. Yes. Um, his character is kind of hastily written out, uh, along with a couple of other major characters from the first movie whose arcs formed uh, some of that ambivalence about the world. I mean, as characters and actors, they weren't all that interesting necessarily. Uh, Alex Pettifer's character and Cody Horn, who was the original uh, love interest. Um, but uh, but um, uh, Matthew McConaughey especially brought so much charisma and, and beyond just taking your shirt off, I mean, as a character, and they try to replace him sort of with the Jada Pinkett Smith character, yeah. uh, which I don't really think succeeds. Yeah. No, nope, totally uh, agree. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of other cameos, kind of sl- yeah. almost cameos with these uh, characters who show up again, sort of in these disconnected scenes. You've got Andy McDowell, uh, Elizabeth Banks, uh, Donald Glover, yeah. <laughs> and and all of these people just just don't really feel like they make any impact on the movie. Like these, they were like, "Wow, that Magic Mike was so fun. Let's see if I can get involved with it." Yeah. So they show up for a few scenes. But it doesn't it doesn't really bring anything to the movie. Yeah, simply like just kind of like um, 
I forget that Michael Strahan, is that his name? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in there, but it just felt like, all right, I get it. It's Michael Strahan. Okay, what does this have to do with anything? I mean, I found myself feeling that a lot in this movie. Just like, okay, what is the point? I just feel like this movie had no point whatsoever. Um, unfortunately, kind of falling into what I think you and I both expected the first one to be. Of just being like, all right, let's just get back, back together. I will say I enjoyed Kevin Nash in this movie. Um, um, I... I'm trying to remember the pronounce the guy's other guy's name that I think was good in this movie that um Joe Mangiliello um I thought was okay. I mean there's a scene he has that I actually I found myself laughing at and I think was the only one of the only scenes I kind of enjoyed um when he's trying to make a convenience store clerk smile. Yeah. But um beyond that, I don't know. I mean, it just didn't all work and it doesn't all make sense and it just felt kind of lazy all in all. Yeah. Um so this was a movie I definitely yeah not recommend. I guess Josh Bell's with me on that, which is good because right. <laughs> you know. Um but nonetheless I'm I'm interested to seeing what kind of money this movie makes. Um, you know, just how box the box office is right now I think is really interesting. Um I'm interested to see how Ted 2 does because we were talking about that last week and, you know, this movie kind of being in between some really huge box office numbers and Magic Mike and Terminator coming out, um, you know, much earlier than usual coming out on a Wednesday instead of a Friday release. It gives them more time to kind of be an audience generator in in a July weekend um, or a 4th of July weekend being – you know, more attractive to audiences. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing how this movie also does, especially against Terminator, which I, which I'm assuming I would think would do very well in the box office, but you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think on, uh, on Tuesday night, at least with the, the early showings, I think they were pretty close to even. So, um, don't underestimate the uh, <laughs> the power of Channing Tatum's abs. The e- exactly, <laughs> yeah. and the, the eagerness. Um, I don't know how it was when you saw the film um, in a regular showing, but at the at the preview screening that I went to, uh, definitely women screaming oh, the yeah. entire time. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I was. I mean, because I went and I, yeah, I chose basically. I went to AMC Town Square where there is a bar and I went at a midnight screening where there was, you know, a, a handful, more than a handful of ladies who probably had their fair share of drinking who actually ended up just wanting to sit right behind us the entire time, which was great. Um, <laughs> just totally celebrating every moment of uh, shirtlessness. So yeah. it was definitely an active screening. I will say yeah. that it was a very active uh, screening. So that was, you know, always enjoyable. But nonetheless, you know. Uh, I definitely not recommend this movie. So, totally across uh, the idea of Magic Mike, we have a movie that some people have been waiting for for uh, quite some time, and that is Terminator Genesis. So, as I was saying, Josh Bell actually on joshbellhateseverything.com went back and revisited all the Terminator films, um, which I did not. I actually only revisited one and two, which, you know, I, I pretty much have watched hundreds of times, but wanted everything to be very crystal clear. Um, but I want to talk to you about Terminator in general before we talk about movies in particular. But Josh, what's your experience with Terminator, the Terminator franchise? Is it something that is very apparent in your life? Are you a big Arnold fan? Just kind of talk about that a little bit with me. Yeah, I, I, the Terminator movies are kind of uh, formative movies for me in 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 watching movies and liking movies. Um, Terminator Two which came out when I was, I think, 11 years old, so definitely a a formative time uh, for taste and whatever. And I remember going to see it on July 4th uh, with my dad at the mall and coming out and seeing fireworks. It's a very clear memory. Uh, And and subsequently, I've seen it dozens of times, probably. Uh, And for a long time, I would always say that this was my favorite movie uh, of all time. So I I have a definite attachment to that movie in particular and to the series in general. The, the, the first Terminator movie I had also seen a number of times, although not nearly as many times. Um, so this is a franchise that I guess I, uh, I have an attachment to. Uh, Arnold in general, I, I, I kind of could take or leave. I think he's made some, some entertaining films. Um, but I think he's also made some very bad films and I'm not necessarily, uh, excited for a movie just because he's in it. 
Uh, but I, I'm not. Um, You're not anti Arnold. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm fine with him, and I think he's very effective in certain kinds of roles. Uh, for example, the Terminator. Yeah. Uh, I think the Terminator movies probably represent some of his best performances because Absolutely. it 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 is exactly within the range of what he can do well. Um, so yeah, I've I've been a big fan uh, of the Terminator movies, especially those first two uh, that James Cameron made. For a very long time, uh, I even like the third Terminator. And as you said, I went back and revisited these movies, all of them, uh, recently. And I think the third Terminator movie, while not nearly on the level of the first two, is a is an entertaining, well made, well paced action movie. Uh, it has a great ending. Uh, the fourth movie, uh, the less said, the better. It's it's just kind <laughs> of a it's, it's, it's a failure on on pretty much every level. Um, so, but I'm inclined to enjoy these movies. I think the concept, I like this kind of sci-fi, uh, with the time paradoxes and the future war and all of that, uh, definitely appeals to the kinds of stories that I like. So I, I would say maybe more than some people, I am open to enjoying a Terminator movie. Um, I feel probably very similar to Josh. I, I would say that. Uh, like Josh, I revisited Terminator 2. I mean, Terminator 2 was pretty much the, I don't, I guess the standalone movie that really struck home with me it was a movie that I watched a lot growing up. It's a movie that I, I continue to love. Um, I'd seen Terminator before, but it wasn't, I actually, even till recently when I was going back to revisit these, I was like, man, I actually don't own Terminator and I probably should own the first one, but it's not the one that I revisit as much as T2. Um, but those two movies are probably some of my favorite action sci-fi movies. I mean, there is so much. And, and it was funny. While I was writing my review for Genesis, um, and I'm not going to get into that yet, but I, I just wrote like the a very simple kind of log line explaining what Terminator is about. And I just sat back and I was like, man, this is just so – it's such a, a genius idea. And, of course, as they go on, they get more complicated and there's more complexity. But, I mean – just the thought of the original Terminator, that idea is just so, I think it's just so smart and it is just so much fun. And go back and go, going back and rewatching Terminator, the only thing I could say that's kind of, I mean, not really negative is just that I only wish I could wipe my memory. And me and Josh were talking about this actually at the screening of Terminator. Um, to watch these movies without knowing so much already, because I mean, if if you watch Terminator and you think about what you what audiences who are watching for the first time aren't informed of, I mean, it's so it's got to be so much more you know effective. But they're still fun. There's still some really great action. Um, Terminator Two, though, I mean, the relationship between Edward Furlong and Arnold is great, especially as I was growing up. I was like, that's so awesome. Um, but I mean, the action in that movie is fun. It has one of the, you know, the liquid metal T one thousand, which is that character is really fun and awesome. And I think, especially watching it this time round, like I really, really appreciate how great Linda Hamilton is in these movies. Um, one, I mean, she's good, but in two, she really kind of just shows the mental anguish this whole movie set her through. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, really good. Uh, Rise of the Machines, I don't think I've seen more than maybe twice. And I think... It came out on DVD, and I think I watched it and then maybe watched it once again. But I really don't have a, a recollection of it at all. And um, and I, I probably really should go back and watch it now just because of my own curiosity of where I would file it in my, my ranking of the Terminator movies. Um, but I, I remember very, very little about it. So I can't really even comment on that one. But remember thinking, obviously, uh, it wasn't as good as 1 and 2. So, you know, it is it is what it is. And then in 2009, I believe, it was when Terminator Salvation comes out. Um, I was working at Hollywood Video at the time, and people were so excited about this movie coming out. I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it while I was I, – I saw it. We these call them pre streets. Basically, we got to see them before we opened up to the um, the public. And I remember watching it, and I was just like, "Oh man, what what a letdown this is!" And I remember like the highlight of everyone was talking about was that oh, the CGI Arnold is going to be in this, so we could kind of see Arnold again in the Terminator movie. And you know, of course, the whole Christian Bale freak out. That was a huge, you know, 
big thing for this movie. And I just remember being really unsatisfied with the movie. I It's another one that I really don't remember enough to be like, oh, yeah, you know. But I remember certain parts. Uh, but I remember telling everyone there were as they were checking them out, like, oh, how was this? I know you watched it, Jake. And I was like, uh, you know. And they were like, no, it's going to be great. And coming back and just being like, what happened? And I, I don't know. So, but key element that I think a lot of Arnold fans and Terminator fans are missing in these two movies um, well, in, in in the last movie, at least, uh, is Arnold. And I think people... Arnold's kind of making a comeback since, what, like 2010? Um, I've not been really a fan of anything that he's done in since his kind of return. You know, The Expendables, or um, what was that one called? The Last Stand, and, and a few others uh, amongst those. Uh, even though I've not seen... Um, uh, what was the new one that he did, Josh? Um where he with his daughter, I believe. Um, oh, Maggie, the Maggie. zombie movie. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see Maggie. So, but other than that, I've just been like, eh, yeah, man. The the Arnold Schwarzenegger comeback has not affected me by any means. But I think it's exciting to kind of see him back in this role. So, nonetheless, we have Terminator Gen. Did you see Maggie? Did you like Maggie? It was, it- uh, I did. I did see Maggie. Um, I, I wasn't crazy about it. I think. Um, the idea of it was more interesting than the execution. Uh, I mean, Arnold tries really hard to do this understated dramatic role, and I just don't think he pulls it off. Gotcha. Um, I mean, the, the movie, too, is so heavy and serious and, and takes this whole zombieism. I mean, the idea being that the daughter, played by Abigail Breslin, is bitten by a zombie, but it takes a certain amount of time for her to turn. So in the meantime, her father, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger, takes her back to the family farm, and he kind of uh, tries to make her comfortable. It's basically like a like a terminal illness kind of drama, you know, him him coming to terms with the fact that his child is going to be dead, and 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 more so that he may actually have to kill his child after she turns into a zombie. Um, it takes that stuff so seriously and it's so somber that I, I feel like it kind of sucked all the enjoyment out of it. And, um, and, and Schwarzenegger again is just, he's stretching a lot. And I, I, and I read reviews that said he really brought something effective to the role. But to me, I just kept watching that thinking uh, this would be a better movie with someone else playing this part. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I don't know how you feel. If you agree with me in the sense that none of his kind of comeback movies have had an effect on you. Um, I know some people like Sabotage. I've actually not seen that one either. Um, but n- none of the movies have kind of had uh, had an effect on me where I'm like, oh, man, Arnold's back, you know, so. Yeah, no, I haven't. I think I've seen all of them. I've seen Sabotage and The Last Stand and uh, Escape Plan, the one where he teams up with Stallone. So that, yeah. And uh, and Maggie and I think that's it. Um, and and all of those I think have interesting ideas, interesting hooks. You know, oh he's going to be serious. We got this serious drama about zombies, or oh he's going to team up with Stallone for the first time, or or the Last Stand, which has um, uh, Kim Kim Ji Woon, I believe, who's a Korean, Korean director yeah. who's done some interesting movies, and this is his first English language movie, or Sabotage from David Ayer, who a lot of people really like, who I don't like, but. Uh, again, interesting kind of collaborations or whatever that I don't think any of them can act. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, nonetheless, um, we have Terminator Genesis, which obviously looks like it's going to be messing with this timeline. And we have an older Arnold back as the Terminator. So, um, like I said earlier, of course, guests go first. Josh, uh, we, we, we actually sat together during the screening. We didn't get to talk much about it after. Um, and I actually kind of stopped myself from reading Josh's review because I wanted to hear it from him um, on this podcast because we actually talked about Magic Mike at the screening of Terminator. Uh, but Josh, sir, what is your thoughts on Terminator Genesis? Well, I mean, like I said, I think I'm inclined to give the benefit of the doubt to to a Terminator movie because I, I do enjoy the franchise so much, or at least the the, the beginnings of it. Um, and I think, you know, in a way, this movie has something in common with with Magic Mike uh, XXL in that it's really pandering to the people who love the Terminator movies. Yeah. That the whole idea of this movie is that we revisit the events. Of the first Terminator movie, but but somehow, and they never really quite explain how, uh, things have changed. And so we see Kyle Reese being sent back in time to pr- uh, protect Sarah Connor from the Terminator, the original Arnold Schwarzenegger 
evil Terminator. Uh, and so a lot in of the... Ni- in, 1984. in 1984. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So a lot of the scenes from the early parts of the original 1984 movie get recreated with these new actors. Uh, but then things have changed, and it turns out that uh, Terminator has been protecting Sarah since she was nine years old. So instead of the scared waitress of the original Terminator movie, she's more along the lines of the badass uh, of Terminator 2, and uh, she ends up having to kind of save Kyle Reese. Uh, and all of that stuff I kind of liked. Even though it was pandering, it was almost like fan fiction, mm-hmm. I thought the way they tweaked it was clever, and uh, the idea of Sarah Connor being this badass already, uh, the idea of the Terminator being in her father figure uh, in the way that he was for John in Terminator 2. Uh, I liked that idea. I thought the way that they explained Arnold being old was clever, that the Terminator's yeah. human flesh would age, which actually sort of makes sense it does within make the sense. context of this movie. I thought um, that was super clever. Yeah, and so I, I at first I was like, well, this is kind of it's kind of amusing. Maybe it's not brilliant. It's really just trading off of what was brilliant before. Yes. But but I kind of like it. Um, but then they get to a point where they have to tell their own story, and it just totally falls apart. Uh, this movie is so convoluted and so full of plot holes. And uh, you know, even though the goal is clear, it's we have to you know stop Skynet and save the world. Uh, which is better than than Terminator Terminator Salvation, where the goal of the characters is never really quite clear. Um, <laughs> like how Skynet was coming into being and why they have to go to this particular time period and do this particular thing was very confusing to me. I thought uh, the way they bring back some characters from Terminator 2, uh, the T-1000 who shows up in the early part of the movie and then just kind of disappears, uh, Miles Dyson who gets nothing to do. I was really disappointed in that and it was re- it really felt like it was just trotting stuff out like, hey, remember this thing? You thought that was cool, didn't you? So we, we have it too. Um and and there's a twist, which I mean, I we don't have to give away, although it's given away in the trailers. Yeah. Um, well, we'll we'll do like a spoiler portion, kind of. Um, I guess. But I will say just uh, just in general about the twist that I didn't feel like it worked at all. I felt like it was a real violation of one of the most important. Like there's there's just a few important thematic elements of this series that make it work, and and this twist invalidates one of the most important elements of the series. I thought so. Overall, I was not that into this movie. I, I thought it started off well and went downhill. I mean, just as a pure action movie, which is, I think, the main way that Rise of the Machines succeeds, I didn't think any of the action season uh, action sequences were all that memorable. Um, eh, the performances range from, you know, Schwarzenegger, who's having fun, obviously, to uh, Jay Courtney, who is super bland, as always, very forgettable, <laughs> uh, and Amelia Clark, who plays Sarah Connor, it's fine, but doesn't hold a candle to what Linda Hamilton did, as you yeah. said, especially in Terminator 2, that Linda Hamilton's performance in Terminator 2 is phenomenal. Um, and, and even Amelia Clark's own work on Game of Thrones, where she's really good, I don't think this lives up to that. So overall, a disappointment for me. Um, yeah, this was a movie that kind of left me on a seesaw. I, I mean, I went back and forth myself for a while. I actually even struggled writing a review, and I think if you read my review, um, you will see, like, I'm like, well, this, this, and this. Well, yeah, but then this, this, and this. So, I mean, this is a movie that I kind of had a tough time with because there was – I was – I was kind of very nervous about Terminator Genesis. I think that I had a lot of doubts of what was happening going into the movie. And I was kind of surprised at some part. Like I, I think Josh said, there's definitely two parts of it where um, it's enjoyable and, and there's some that's kind of like, oh, wow, that is pretty cool that they're redoing this and they do it very well. Um, but there's also, you know, things that just don't work in the movie. And, and, and you know, I think that for me, you know, they it could have easily been cut about 15, 20 minutes for me. I think there was a lot, a kind of a, a decent amount of fat that could have just been trimmed off because I felt towards the end of the picture that I was really dragging. I was like, all right, all right. Um, but uh, I think that I think Arnold is the most comfortable he's been since his comeback in this movie. Like you said, he's having a good time. I really enjoyed watching him. I think it's just because he's back in his element and it's comfortable. It's what we know. So I enjoyed watching him in it. I think he was great. Like you said, 
um, Amelia Clark was okay. You know, I was I, I, watching her in the trailer. I was like, oh no, that's that's. Uh, but in the, watching her in the movie, she's okay. I haven't watched Game of Thrones just yet, but I've heard she's obviously much better than what she brought to this picture. Um, but yeah, I think that you know, kind of this movie, which essentially changes everything. Um, you know, it kind of uh, eliminating the past, terminating the past, if you will, to recreate this new future for what they are hoping, uh, from what I've been reading, is, is a whole new trilogy on its own, eliminates a lot of what we know as fans. And like Josh said, he even said it when he was talking, the reason why isn't very clear. I mean, um, I don't know if I should hold, I, I, I guess I'll hold the details to spoilers. Um, but there is an event that happens, but we're just told about it, and it's just kind of thrown in there, and you're like, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, what, what? When did this happen? And they kind of talk about it and use flashbacks, but it never really kind of is easy to digest. It's never something that I, I think that I couldn't take by just being said in a dialogue offset where there's like, oh, by the way, this and this happened. I felt the relationship uh, between um, Jai Courtney uh, and um, Amelia Clark in this movie, the mother and father of who would eventually become John Connor, feels really forced in this movie. It didn't really work for me um, in the few scenes that they were like supposed to be having this chemistry. And obviously, we all know the secret, but um, Kyle Reese is not in tune to it just yet. Uh, but I did really enjoy the chemistry between... Um, Arnold and her. I, I did really like that relationship. Obviously, I think because, like you said, Josh, it, it, it reignites that the Edward Furlong and Arnold Schwarzenegger relationship from Terminator 2. Um, I think that I had a good time in this movie to a degree, but by the time I was, by the time by the movie was over, I was like, all right, I'm over it. I think that it's fun for a while, but you know, it kind of runs out of its, its, its speed very early in the movie. Um, I thought it was kind of cool with Though it's not really explained necessarily either, but like just how we've evolved Skynet. And I, uh, I, I'm just particular about this movie because I know people have been avoiding so much about it. So I don't want to give anything away and I don't know what people consider spoilers or not, but what they did with Skynet to make it a little bit more modernized and, and t technology that we use today, I, I kind of enjoyed. But like Josh said, it's kind of a throwaway and a lot of things are just kind of thrown away, thrown into this movie without much conviction or reason. And I think that's kind of reason why it doesn't all work or come together very well. Yeah, I I agree. I, I thought what they did with Skynet was kind of lame, to be honest. I, I thought it was <laughs> oh, it was it know. was it was a desperate like, oh wait, no, we're it's an app. Yeah, apps are <laughs> apps are things that people use now. We're gonna make it an app. Oh, yeah. um, it doesn't need to be an app. It's for the military. <laughs> the military still uses computers and and software, and more so now than ever. I think so. Uh, I didn't really like that, and uh, I mean, I don't know if we want to hold this for spoilers, but the the sort of projections of Skynet's personality or whatever they, that we see in this movie didn't make any sense to me. It reminded me of, uh, of Helena Bonham Carter in Terminator Salvation, who ends up becoming somehow the embodiment of Skynet, Skynet which, which yeah. also, which also made no sense in that movie. <laughs> well, um, oh, go yeah. on. I mean, Skynet is not a person the, the whole idea of Skynet is that it is not a person. It is a computer system that doesn't, you speak it doesn't have a personality or whatever and so to give it that i feel like really takes away some of the power of skynet which is that it's this alien thing that we can't even really understand mm -hmm. so uh yeah i mean it, it, again it's, it's sort of a throwaway it's not an essential um uh, element of the movie necessarily but i i just thought to me that was silly and if the, the title comes from the name uh, of the, the of evolved the app. on it, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I don't understand why they have to call it that, and they can't just call it Skynet. But um, <laughs> yeah, so no, I, to me that didn't really work. Um, well, I, I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I think we both kind of agree. I think I would say I, I don't, Josh. What, what did you give it star wise? I mean, I gave it two and a half stars, which again is you know kind of down the middle because I, I did think the first part of it was clever. I did like watching Arnold. Um, you know, it worked better than it could have, but overall, I think it didn't succeed as much as it should have. And of course, uh, like Magic Mike, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier, you can read Josh's review, um, at lasvegasweekly.com. Uh, just follow him on Twitter. He tweets it out all the time at signal bleed. Um, yeah, I actually gave it two and a half out of, uh, two and a half stars as well, but I know that you do five, I do four. So I, I think that I kind of was a little bit more forgiving to this movie. Um, yeah. 
But nonetheless, we're going to move on to spoilers. I would say, eh, I think if you're a Terminator fan, you'll probably enjoy it. If you've stuck by all the Terminators before, it's, you know, it's it's not the worst movie of the, of the, of the list, I would say. Do you, did you like it better than Salvation? Yeah, it's better than Salvation. Yeah. I mean, if, if for no other reason than Schwarzenegger is actually in it, <laughs> yeah. um, and you get to see him... Uh, revisit that role. Uh, Salvation is missing that, but um, yeah, Salvation is is, is still the worst of yeah. the series. I and it's so funny you brought up that how they explain how Arnold's older. I was just like, man, that is so clever, so simple, so understandable, but so clever. Right. Um, no, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. But okay. Nonetheless, um, I think yeah. If you're a Terminator fan, you're a diehard Terminator. You're gonna go see these movies. You're gonna probably find it somewhere in your heart to enjoy them. I think it is better than Salvation. I'll agree with Josh on that uh, because. Because I don't remember Rise of the Machines, it's hard for me to label if this one is more enjoyable than Rise of the Machines. Um, I, I, I'll do my best to go back and rewatch that and, and pick that then. I'm assuming, Josh, you're sticking with Rise of the Machines over this one? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I was I was pleasantly surprised watching Rise of the Machines again recently because I knew I had enjoyed it the first time when it was out in theaters, but obviously that was a long time ago. Uh, but coming back to it, I still thought it was entertaining. Uh, so I would put that ahead of this movie if, if for no other reason than that it's more it's more fun to watch. Okay, uh, so yeah, I think we both agree. You could read our reviews, like I said, you could read Josh's at LasVegasWeekly dot com or follow him on Twitter at SignalBleed. He tweets all of his links out, uh, and of course ours on ChasingCinema dot com. But right now, if you've not seen the movie yet and you don't want to know any more, you don't want to hear anything that is possibly known as a spoiler. I rec- I thank you for tuning into this episode. Um, but pause it and come back to it later because I want to talk about some things in particular which might be considered spoiler if you've not watched the trailer or if you, you know, I'm going to be talking about the ending in particular. So thank you so much for tuning in. Go check out our reviews. Thank you so much. Now we're going to start the spoiler discussion. Um, okay. So the big thing here is that, for me at least, um, we are told in passing that. There was a Terminator sent back to kill an early Sarah Connor. But, and that's the reason why everything changed, right? Right. But to me, that's just like, wait, what? How do you just say that in passing? When did this happen? Who, you know, when did Skynet decide to do this? You know, who, I don't know. That really, really, th- who reprogrammed the Terminator to go? I don't know. That really threw me off. I Just kind of handing me that information in passing. And though later in the movie, we do kind of get a flashback sort of it was just like wait what when did you guys decide to do this and and why is this information just kind of thrown in there did you feel the same about that or i just thought that was not convincing enough for me to be like oh our whole terminate our whole timeline that we've learned and um kind of understood is gone because of this yeah i mean i i think some of these things that don't get explained may be deliberately held off so that they can reveal them in a potential sequel oh okay um i but i I might be wrong about that um but i thought they they called attention to the idea that that particular thing was not explained because I think Kyle Reese asks who sent the Terminator back to, to help Sarah when she was nine. And the Terminator says, Oh, that information has been deleted from my files. And Sarah says, we don't know. And so they're trying to, to make sure that the audience knows, knows that, this that they is, don't know yet. Right. That this is a mystery. Um, and so I wonder if that's something that the screenwriters or the producers have in mind that maybe they know. Or they're the still answer. trying to figure it out. <laughs> or that. But that but that revealing the answer will be some big plot point in yeah. the potential sequel. Which I think is annoying because this, this is like what Marvel movies do where things are deliberately left out of a movie so that you can put them in a sequel. Mm. Uh, I, I, I think that's a cop-out and that's a cheat to your audience because – you want to tell a full story. I mean, this does tell a full story and, and, and it has an ending that's more conclusive than I think I expected. Um, but at the same time, yeah, leaving things out like that or kind of hinting at, Oh, this is who knows what could, what could this be? And then, <laughs> and then not following up on it just, just doesn't make me want to see a sequel. It makes me irritated with this movie. Uh, and of course there might not be a sequel. Uh, Terminator Salvation was initially also intended to kick off a new trilogy that would take place in the whole world that that was created there. And because it didn't make any money or make enough money that, that never happened. And so if this movie isn't successful enough or if the, the rights, because there's always rights issues with Terminator, um, you know, don't, if the rights don't persist with these producers, 
then there might not be a direct sequel to this movie and all of those ideas might just get lost. Get lost anyway. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I just think it would, to me, I had a really hard time swallowing that pill and I was just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? Yeah. Like, hold on. Especially because of just the effect, the like how big, if it was something else, you know, maybe a, a something that we've discovered, but it's not. But I mean, this literally is telling us, oh, this event that we're not really telling you about changed everything that we know. Right. I like, so I think that was hard for me to swallow. Now, number two, well, we'll leave the big the big twist for the end. But how did you feel about the ending of the movie? Like the uh, very kind of last few minutes. I, I, I thought it was a little yeah, it was a little cheesy. Um, again, I was a little surprised that it was so definitive. I mean, because right? I know they're planning yeah. sequels. And the way this movie ends is very much... We have averted Judgment Day. Everything will be fine. And they, they kind of echo the ending of Terminator 2 where it's now our, our fate is unknown to us and we can make our own destiny, which is something that's big for Sarah throughout this movie because she talks about how she's never, especially now that she's been with this Terminator since she was a child, she's never been able to have her own life. She's always been told she's going to grow up and father this child and meet this guy who's going to be the father of the child and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so I was a little surprised that they put such a period on it at the end because you know then if they're going to do a sequel, they're going to have to undo a bunch of that. Yeah, um, it just felt so clean. Like it just felt too clean for a Terminator sequel or ending for me where it was just like, okay, we're all going to get in our truck and we're just going to drive into the sunset. I was like, wait, what? Like what? I, to me, I just felt everything kind of cleaned up a little bit too nicely. Yeah, and you know, the thing that annoyed me most about the ending is that uh, the Terminator, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, makes the sacrifice, which is which is similar to what he does in Terminator Two. Yes, and and dies, but then through a like a throwaway line <laughs> that they that they had earlier. Well, you know, as soon as he said that line, I'm like, oh, that's important. They point <laughs> they pointed that out for no reason, so it's going to come up later. Um, and, and suddenly at the end of the movie, he's like, oh yeah, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> I've been upgraded or whatever. Now, <laughs> yeah. now he's he's like a liquid metal Terminator 2 or something. I yeah. didn't quite understand that. But to me, that was the biggest bull about the ending was that Arnold gets to live. Yeah. Um, which, which is, you know, it just seems like a, a movie star thing that they have to concede to Arnold to get him in the movie. Like, oh, you're going to live this time. So yeah. that annoyed me. Yeah, I mean, and it was just so like, oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, right, it right. doesn't even make sense. You're like, oh, okay, he fell in that thing, but wait, what? Like, how did that all of a sudden just change exactly who he is and, and his whole entire model? But yeah, I agree with you. Um, but right now, let's talk about the major twist of the movie. And, it, you know, again, I've said spoilers plenty. If you've already listened this far, I, I guess, you know, whatever. You obviously don't care. Um, that John Connor is partial partial cyborg or or somehow you know is is i guess is the way you describe it um do you think before we actually get to how we feel about it um me and you kind of had this discussion do you feel it was a mistake to release this information in the trailer because i believe the directors even come forth since the movie come out and said i didn't approve that but you know what happened and and it really kind of affected a major twist in the movie yeah, I mean, I don't know. Over time, things like that kind of don't matter as much because once a movie's been out, uh, people end up hearing about it anyway. Um, and as I think I, we were talking about, apparently, and I don't remember this because I was too young, yes. but uh, apparently the, the trailers for Terminator 2 revealed what's a major twist in that movie that the Arnold Schwarzenegger character, who's the villain of the first movie, is now good, um, which was a big deal. And I think if you go into Terminator 2 not knowing that, it has much more impact. Now, granted, that's something that happens much earlier in the movie in Terminator 2. I think that Absolutely, happens probably yeah. 15, 15, 20 minutes, minutes in, into yeah. the movie. Whereas this, the twist here in Genesis is, is sort of, I don't know, halfway through the movie, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe it, it's a sign of desperation that the, the studio was thinking, uh-oh, people aren't going to go see this movie. We better give them something that will entice them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't think it was a fatal mistake. Uh, I mean, partially because I just think it dramatically it's a, it's, it's a mistake to have this twist in the movie at all. Yeah, okay. So, so tell me how you feel about the twist in, in general now. I, I mean, I think – the entire concept of the Terminator movies is based on the idea that John is the savior of humanity. 
that he is this great leader who would never compromise and will never give up. And even though maybe that makes him sort of a one-dimensional character, I think there's actually a lot of shading that you can do with that and that they do in Terminator 2 with Edward Furlong and that they even do in Terminator 3 with Nick Stahl. Um, but, but again, the whole driving force behind every storyline in all of these movies is the idea that John will save humanity. We need to preserve his existence and, and that he is this, this one person who can see the light at the end of the tunnel, who will not give up, who will not concede, who will fight until his last dying breath. And in this movie, he just kind of gives up. <laughs> He's like Magic Mike. He's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> This, these uh, two movies have more in common than we could have imagined. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I thought that was a big failure. I didn't think Jason Clark was a good enough act. I mean, I think he is a good actor, but I don't know if he really did a good enough job of selling this whole idea in this movie. And, and just the fact that John is the villain in, in the movie, in the last half of the movie, I just was like, no. And then the happy ending is that they kill John Connor. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, well, I, yeah, I thought that was a big failure. Um, I, to me, I think it was really in the effectiveness. Like, to me, it, on paper, it's like, all right, that's, I guess, I mean, like you said, you know, obviously, on the terms of what these elements this movie stands on, you know, you couldn't buy into it. But, you know, I wasn't as against it as, as, as I guess you were. But to me, I was just like, he kind of just turns into a regular villain at one point where it's like it's it kind of loses all interest and he's just another villain a villainous terminator going after trying to kill them and it just kind of loses its heat for me where it was like oh you know that's you know it's john connor it just kind of becomes a terminator and it's just like all right so to me it was just really ineffective at the end of it i mean um to what on paper i'm sure sounded great to execs just didn't end up working out for me in any sense of like, you know, and then you say like, they kill off John Connor. It's just like, wait, what? <laughs> like we didn't, we couldn't figure it out. Uh, yeah. And just how that whole, and even how that kind of situation arose of like how he is turned into this thing. It's just like, wait, what? I don't know. There was just a lot that was hard to swallow in this movie. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and even the idea of, okay, John is a Terminator. What can we do with that? They could have played up the, the conflict between John, the person that we have yeah, established, absolutely. and this sort of in, infection or whatever he's had from Skynet. And they don't. He just, like you said, he just becomes a, a, a straight up villain. He's totally evil. He has no shading to him at all. No, no um, complex. There's no John Connor. Like, it's John Connor when we find out, but it's not really John Connor. It's just another Terminator. Right. And, um,. Yeah, I mean, or, or even the idea that John Connor has come around to Skynet's point of view somehow. You yeah. know, Skynet showed me the light or whatever. Um, no, he's just as evil. He still wants to wipe out humanity. I think it would have been interesting if John Connor and Skynet had, like, teamed up somehow. And Skynet was like, you know what? I'm not going to wipe out humanity, but I'm going to do this other thing that was still somehow, you know, against the goals of our, our hero All characters right. or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I don't. We don't need to rewrite the movie for them, but I just feel like... <laughs> Maybe we should. There's a way that they maybe could have made that twist work, even though I'm very against it. I would have loved yeah. to see them convince me if, you know, if that showed up and I thought, oh, God, this is terrible. How are they going to do this? And then by the end of the movie, I thought, you know what? They actually pulled it off. That would have been great, but they didn't. Yeah. No, I'm right there with you. Is is my whole thing was what they were going to do with it, and I felt that that was the effectiveness. I, it wasn't so hard for me to, you know, like they got John, but I was just like, all right, that's kind of interesting. Where do we go from here, and how do we bring, either bring John back? How do we, you know, or or anything? But it doesn't. Like, I mean, he just kind of turns into any other villain, and it's like, all right, well, that was useless. Right. Um, you know, you could have replaced him with anyone else and kept John Connor in the future, and then it wouldn't have even mattered, yeah. essentially. Yeah, you know, it doesn't have a different feeling, and I think that was kind of the, the biggest letdown in that is, is is how that was just used. And, yeah, that was disappointing, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I think disappointing, again, is, is my overall reaction to this movie. Yeah, and it doesn't help that this movie is, you know, amongst, you know, like, thinking about just putting that movie that title amongst terminator one and two in my collection is just like oh man only if you know it's 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 tough when you follow movies like that as well um so 
unfortunately, I'm placing it in the third of the third on my list just because I don't remember Rise of Machines, but um, I'm gonna have to go back and revisit those. And, and I'm, I mean, I think like many, it's falling in the fourth spot uh, of most people from what I've talked to. So yeah, that's how I feel about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So because I mean, Salvation was just awful, but yes. Um, and did you did you say everything you wanted to say about uh, Genesis being uh, personified? Yeah, I don't know what else there is to say about that. I mean, I think it's again. I just think it was it was silly, yeah. and and like I said, Skynet should not be a person. Yeah, Skynet. It was it was a bad idea when they did it in Salvation, it was a and bad idea. it's a bad idea here. And and I mean, I think this actually goes again to the John Connor twist that if you're going to personify Skynet and cast an actor, cast Matt Smith from Doctor Who, who is a recognizable actor that a lot of people like. You know, then then go with that. Have John Connor and Skynet, you know, I don't know, have a conversation yeah. and 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 really delve into why they would team up or why they would, uh, you know, agree with each other somehow. But but instead we, we get none of that. And John is a villain and Skynet is a villain. And they're both just kind of standing there being like, ha ha, we're going to kill all you humans. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's no there's no nuance to it. And Skynet doesn't need to be a nuanced character. Again, the idea about Skynet is that it's single minded. It doesn't have nuances. Yeah. But if you're going to make it a person, then then make it an interesting one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um Again, today, Josh, thank you so much for taking time out and sitting and talk with us. You can read all of Josh's reviews at LasVegasWeekly.com. You can read more at JoshBellHatesEverything.com. Uh, but I, like I said, the most, the best thing you could do is follow him on twitter at signal bleed he tweets out all the links and um you know you'll be able to read everything from him there you can read all of my reviews at chasing cinema.com of course and make sure to check out all the daily videos that we do at youtube.com slash chasing cinema josh thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to sit and talk about this uh we're gonna have to plan that batman and robin podcast <laughs> at one point in time uh, oh, thank- i can't wait <laughs> thank you so much sir um i really really appreciate it Thanks for having me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning into this week's official podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Toronto. Today I was joined by Josh Bell. Uh, and please continue chasing cinema. Uh-huh.